Okay, I'm Lawrence Cohen. Um, welcome to the Center for South Asian Studies. When Professor Williams announced uh, her retirement, many of us were terrified that South Asia would be allowed to wither in art history at Berkeley. And we're very grateful not only that it didn't, but that Professor Ray uh, has come. Um, his work is rather extraordinary. Uh, not only is he a scholar of uh, the early modern and modern uh, questions of built environment, uh, but across genres of music, of film, of, of, of uh, visual, of uh, uh, architecture. Um, um, but he has um, an extensive earlier life in looking at sculpture in the fifth century, uh, Buddhist sculpture specifically. Um, and uh, he's been working most recently on a series of engagements with museological practice. Um, the uh, uh, professor did his uh, BA at Presidency College in, of course, Kolkata, uh, his MA uh, from uh, Baroda, Department of Art History, his MPhil at the Center for Studies in Social Science at Kolkata, his PhD in the Department of Art History at the University of Minnesota. He has taught in Minnesota at Michigan at UCLA, uh, and of course, he is now uh, our colleague here. Um, it is, um, let me just say a few other quick things. Um, in addition to his breadth of thinking across genre and across period, um, he, for me, represents the coming together at Berkeley of a series of conversations that have been kept dispersed around space and spatiality. So a series of conversations uh, in uh, the history of art and architecture, on the one hand, um, in departments of geography, sociology, anthropology, um, in the history of the colonial, and in a series of philosophical engagements loosely organized around Kant, um, and rejections thereof. Um, the, uh, his work, as I began to read it, pushes, um, pushes these into a different relation, and it's a great uh, pleasure uh, to have him here. So thank you. Thanks, Lawrence, for a very, very generous introduction, and also Punita and Christine for asking me to speak today. And I, I want to start by talking about a very strange ritual that I saw at a temple in Jaipur. The Ramachandra temple in the Western Indian city of Jaipur is not very different from countless other similar temples that mark India's urban landscape. Like in every other temple, the resident priest offers water, flowers, and incense to the sound of the conch and devotional hymns every evening to mark the end of the day. However, after worshipping the icon, the priest at this particular temple turns to a framed print carefully hung on a wall beside the sanctum. The print, a circa 1950 lithograph depicting the sacred landscape of Braj, a 90 square mile region in North India, around 60 miles south of Delhi, a region where the Hindu god Krishna is believed to have spent his youth. Braj is the primary pilgrimage center in North India for Krishna worshippers. The print depicting the sacred landscape of Braj is offered incense, water and fire from the camphor lamp. With great care, the priest then runs his finger over the roadways depicted on, in the image. Evening worship or Sandhya Arati is then formally concluded. I observe this peculiar practice, this ritual really, over a number of days during my visit to Jaipur in 2005. Conversation with the temple priest revealed that his father had acquired the lithograph during a pilgrimage to Braj in the early 1950s. The lithograph depicting Krishna performing miraculous deeds and devotees worshipping the Divine Lord, framed by a meandering roadway marking the pilgrimage route in the region, was subsequently framed and displayed at the temple. This particular ritual, the act of traveling through the forests of Braj by tenderly tracing the roadways on the image with one's finger, has no historical antecedent or theological validation. Neither have I seen the ritual being performed at any other temple. However, the corporeal topophilia inherent in this performative gesture is not out of place. The landscape of Braj was, according to Vaishnava theology, the theology of Krishna worship, a topographic form of the divine. By running his fingers through the roadway 
depicted in the print, the priest at the Ramachandra temple was thus circumambulating both the geographic space of Braj and Krishna himself imagined as embodied space. Yet, there is something uncharacteristic about this specific image. Unlike pre-19th century liturgical representations of the landscape of Braj, the artist had carefully demarcated the modern roadways that had been built in the region in the late 19th century. Why were modern roadways, indicative of the colonial presence on the Indian landscape, to quote David Arnold, suddenly introduced in visual representations of Braj, especially when the sacred topos of the region was perceived as no different from the body of Krishna himself? Scholars have suggested that the modern roadways as a network of power had become symptomatic of the modernizing project of the colonial state, the making of state space as an internal component of the imperial economy. And here I'm referring to a body of scholarship from David Arnold, Anand Young, to Manu Goswami's more recent Producing India. From 1780 onwards, the British had begun extending the pre-existing network of Mughal roadways. By the 1840s, metal roads were built by the colonial government across India. Not only did these roads allow for an easy movement of the British army across the subcontinent, but as scholars have suggested, also made possible the economic growth and consolidation of the empire. Scholars thus argue that it was modern roadways as a network of power that became symptomatic of the modernizing project of the colonial state, the making of state space as an internal component of the imperial economy. Today, I, want to I would like to suggest that a slight shift in our frames of inquiry will allow us to emphasize this process of making state space beyond the economies of colonial governance, as localized practices that operated both within and beyond the economies of colonial governance. Drawing on theological discourses on religious patronage, dana, devotees and priests sponsored many of the colonial roads that connected the pilgrimage sites in Braj. In 1832, the princely state of Gwalior constructed a road connecting Mathura and Vrindavan. This was the only link between the two primary pilgrimage towns in Braj. The 1860s saw the beginning of a number of road building projects under indigenous patronage, and by 1868, five roads were built in Vrindavan itself to allow access to the temples in the town. And I've marked the roads in red. In the same year, large-scale indigenous patronage led to trees being planted along the principal roads of the Mathura district with gardens at regular intervals. These acts of patronage, recuperated through stray references in the colonial archive, suggest that the project of building roadways in 19th and 20th century Braj was not merely the prerogative of the colonial government. The indigenous elite was an equal participant in the making of imperial state space. Even as late as the 1930s, the Public Works Department looked towards private contribution for maintaining the roadways in Braj. If indeed the British attempts to build a network of roadways that connected the vast spaces of the subcontinent were symptomatic of the modernizing project of the colonial state, why did priests and devotees in Braj participate willingly and wholeheartedly <coughs> in the making of this state space. What was the relationship between representations of roadways in liturgical imagery and their actual construction? Could these interventions be read as signaling a new localized vocabulary of imagining both space and travel that acknowledged, engaged with, yet remade the space of the empire? I see late 19th and early 20th century local road building projects and its insertion in liturgical representations as moments of fissure that operated both within and beyond the dominant cartographies of the British Empire. While these fissures, insidious and fragmentary, acknowledge the hegemonic aspirations of colonial road making and the epistemological violence of the imperial project of mapping India, they simultaneously transformed state space for counter hegemonic purposes. In doing so, the local elite of Braj re-enchanted and re-inscribed modern cartography to render it appropriate for the habitation of their beloved Krishna. 
Recent scholarship on print culture, however, provides us with a frame to better understand the array of complex practices that revolved around the making of space, both real and metaphoric, in 19th and early 20th century India. Moving against the overt emphasis in earlier scholarship on imperial interventions in the making of a culture of spatiality in colonial India, Sumati Ramaswamy, for instance, uses the idea of barefoot cartography to show how early 20th century nationalism disrupted the cold gaze of colonial cartography through valorizing the map as devotional, anthropomorphic, or even maternal. She writes about prints such as these that remade the colonial map into a space of nationalist desires. The very form of the modern map was revisualized, remade. But were all cartographic imaginaries in this period necessarily embedded within nationalist discourses? What of the local? This is the question that I want to work with today. Most of us are familiar with pre-20th century representations of pilgrimage sites, such as the ones on the screen. We know that these paintings of sacred spaces were not maps in the modern sense. Rather, these paintings operated as objects of veneration, a visualization of sacred landscape. Even as key temples were recognizably rendered, space was abstracted to provide the devotee with a visual tool to imagine the ritualistic act of traveling through the site. Braj too had a similar tradition of depicting sacred landscape. There is, however, a key difference between pre-colonial liturgical representations of Braj and other pilgrimage sites. While representations of sites such as Nathadwara on, on the top, an important pilgrimage town in Western India for Krishna worshippers, almost always included the principal roadways that ran through the site, and it's marked in brown here. Paintings depicting Braj usually did not show the roadways that marked the route of the pilgrim. Given that Braj was seen in Vaishnava theology, theology of Krishna worship, as a corporeal representation of Krishna himself, notions of embodied space perhaps necessitated a different localized visual vocabulary. Thus, in an early 19th century painting, the icon of Krishna as Srinathji emerges from the Govardhan hill in Braj. According to local legends, the Govardhan hill, marked in red on the map, had started bleeding when workmen digging a well had struck the hill. That night, Krishna appeared in a dream to the workmen, explaining that their tools had cut his body and that they should refrain from further construction. The worship of Govardhan then involved imagining the hill as a living being, as Krishna himself. Even today, innumerable shrines at the site attest to this practice of visualizing the hill as Krishna. Pilgrims are thus discouraged from climbing the hill, the prohibition of which can be traced back to the revitalization of the site in the 16th century. By the 16th century, the act of devotion to the natural landscape of Braj had already become a key mode of articulating devotion. In 1552, the Vaishnava theologian Narayan Bhatt had written the Brajavakti Vilasa, one of the most elaborate texts ever composed on the sacred geography of Braj. The seventh chapter of the text prescribed the route of the journey through the forests of Braj, the Vanayatra, a circumambulation of the important pilgrimage towns in the region. Arising from a larger practice of the circumambulation of temples and shrines, the circular Vanayatra, or journey through the forests of Braj, allowed pilgrims to gain merit. Given the significance of Braj's groves, forests, and lakes in 16th century constructions of piety, the landscape of Braj was transformed into an iconic space that embodied the structural and conceptual meanings of a temple. By circumambulating Braj, pilgrims could at least in theory map the conceptual space of mythological Braj onto the cognitive and real spaces of a worldly Braj. 16th century texts repeatedly reiterate the celestial beauty of Braj, describing in detail the leaves and fruits of trees which gleam like divine jewels. The corporeal topophilia inherent in such imaginings 
thus drew the devotee into a bodily relation with space. That is, by perceptibly experiencing the sacred space of Braj, devotees could at least devotees could immerse his or her body in sacred space. Thus, most pre-1850s pictorial representations of Braj did not depict roadways that demarcated the route of circumambulation. Rather, the painted image operated as a conceptual landscape, an object of veneration. Even as the primary architectural markers of the various pilgrimage towns, for example, the Bishrant Ghat at Mathura, was realistically rendered, space was abstracted into a picture that could provide the devotee a visual tool to imagine the ritualistic act of traveling through the groves of Praj. Of course, this act of abstraction, the visualization of the metaphysical space of Braj, was situated within a larger history of depicting Braj's topography through a mythological schema. Imagining Braj as a lotus, with each petal symbolizing a forest, texts such as the Bhagavad Purana and the Varaha Purana present the landscape of Braj as a mandala, a schematized representation of the unmanifest world where Krishna plays eternally. In pictorial practices, the topographic details, the groves and the forests, were carefully inscribed on the petal of the lotus flower. Devotees used representations of this landscape, for, the, for instance the one on the screen, as a visual focus for meditation. According to sectarian literature, Krishna and his consort Radha occupied the center of the lotus, lotus imagined as Vrindavan, while the other pilgrimage centers were marked on the surrounding petals. Other Vaishnava sects in Braj too proposed their own route of the Vanayatra or the circumambulatory journey to counter the overt emphasis on specific sites in Narayan Bhat's Rajavakti Vilasa. If Narayan Bhat's Rajavakti Vilasa was centered on the key sites of Mathura and Vrindavan, the 16th century priest Vallavacharya's son, Vithalnatha's 1567 Vanayatra, on the other hand, began at Gokul. Thus, Vithalnatha attempted to redraw the route, making Gokul the center of, Vanaya, of the Vanayatra. By the 18th century, paintings on cloth known as Pichwais hung behind icons in temples owned by, the Vithal, by Vithalnatha's followers repeatedly portrayed the sites that were marked in Vithalnatha's version of the Vanayatra. While devotees used the lotus mandala as a visual focus for meditation, followers of Vithalnatha displayed the pichwai or the paintings on cloth in temples during October, the very month of the Vanayatra. Most pre-1830s paintings thus depict Braj through two distinct modalities, the landscape as a lotus mandala and pichwais or the Vanayatra. However, it is only with the 20th century that representations of Braj began including roadways, carefully marking out the devotee's movement through sacred geography. Of course, I'm not suggesting that roadways were introduced in the pictorial practices in South Asia only in this period. Susan Gold, for instance, has documented a number of pre-colonial maps, both religious and administrative, that consistently and accurately marked roads, irrigation canals, property, or even the travel routes for pilgrims. In the Vaishnava pilgrimage site of Nathadwara in Rajasthan, artists painted maps of the town that clearly marked the roads that led to important temples. Pilgrimage sites such as Nathadwara were centered on specific temples and hence the representation of roads leading to the temples. In contrast, the careful omission of roadways in pre-colonial liturgical imagery of Braj perhaps suggests that the act of devotion to the natural landscape of Braj had become a key mode of articulating piety. But what had changed in the 19th and the early 20th century? Why did early 20th century representations of Braj include roadways to define movement from one site to another? It is no coincidence that roadways were introduced in visual practices at the very moment when the local elite was making considerable financial contribution to rebuild the roadway system in the region. The act of building roads was then coterminous to the reimagining of sacred space. Given the theological significance of Braj as a space no different from the celestial, the making of roadways was a speech act that reclaimed modern space, recalibrated, remade, and transformed state space into a space of enchantment. 
sociological space was thus made from within the space of modern governance. While it is difficult to establish the precise moment when roadways were introduced in representations of Brudge, theological texts published in the 1870s had already started including modern maps of the region. An 1873 edition of a 16th century description of Brudge published from Mathura had as its frontispiece a woodblock print of a modern map of Brudge with legends and key roadways demarcated with dotted lines. Even though most early 19th century religious depictions of Brudge continued to imagine the landscape through systems that were determined by earlier spatio-visual conventions, this text, published by a local press in Mathura, prefigured a fundamental transformation in image-making practices in the region. And incidentally, uh, this particular copy was acquired by the Sa Sanskritist Monia Williams in Mathura in 1876. So perhaps he actually thought it was important enough to take a copy back to Oxford with him. The incorporation of a colonial technique of power, the modern roadway systems within devotional cartographies suggests an epistemological shift from the metaphysical image of space to the map as a representation of territory. Unlike earlier representations, Krishna was not present within the space of this map. The label categorically asserts that this, that this indeed was a naksha. The Persianate word used in Mughal code administration to describe city plans and navigational charts. Printed within 10 years of the construction of a number of roadways in the Mathura district, the artist responsible for this naksha or map very carefully demarcated the new roads that were being built across the region by priests and devotees. The 1873 naksha was only the beginning of a new mode of representing the sacred landscape of Braj that would become widespread in the early 20th century. With the sudden increase in road building in the 1930s, printing presses in Mathura and elsewhere released a number of lithographs depicting the Braj landscape with modern roadways clearly marked on the print. The 1930s expansion of a network of roads connecting the various pilgrimage towns in Braj had a direct effect in the increase of pilgrimage in the region. In 1937-38, the pilgrimage tax collected at Braj was the highest in the United Provinces, today's in Uttar Pradesh. That the pilgrimage tax collected here was higher than that collected at other equally or perhaps more important pilgrimage sites such as Varanasi, Allahabad and Haridwar suggests the importance of roadways in making Braj one of the key Hindu pilgrimage sites in North India. The easy access to the region due to a network of roadways with, that was built with indigenous support was perhaps responsible for this increase. Although certainly railways had played a key role in the growth of pilgrimage in the early 20th century, by the 1930s increasing motor traffic had led to a decline in rail revenue. To prevent the steady decline in revenue, the Indian state railways aggressively launched an advertising campaign in the 1930s. The railway department commissioned an internationally renowned French illustrator, Roger Brothers, to design a poster promoting travel to Braj. Brothers' poster was part of a larger 1930s railway series on the key pilgrimage sites in North India, including Bodh Gaya and Varanasi. The Mathura poster depicted the famed Bishrand Ghat, the very space where Krishna is said to have rested after killing his evil uncle. The poster, with its domes, graceful red sandstone architecture, and teeming pilgrims, produced a mise-en-scene of Orientalist fantasy, whose genealogy could very easily be traced back to innumerable 19th century European photographs of the region. Given Broder's internationalist art deco aesthetic, the use of English text, and the deployment of earlier colonial techniques of imagining the sacred space of Mathura, it can be safely assumed that the 1930s campaign was directly addressed to European tourists and travelers visiting India. Lithographs such as these, on the other hand, were produced specifically for pilgrims coming to Braj. While a few versions of the lithograph were printed in Mathura, most entrepreneurs turned to larger printing presses in Bombay and Calcutta. 
Visually, the lithographs used an established format that drew its source from pre-colonial religious representations of space. Combining both multiple oblique perspective and a planimetric view, the lithographs were very similar to pre-colonial painted representations of pilgrimage towns such as Natadwara. While the depiction of bridges, pontoons, and the roadways that were being constructed in the 1930s created a certain planimetric fidelity to the topography of the region, frontal perspective was used to represent the numerous sacred sites of Braj. In spite of a certain planimetric fidelity, these representations differed fundamentally from modern cartography that aimed to reduce space into a homogeneous empty grid. The quest for an appropriate visual language to represent sacred space, a language that could, make, that could simultaneously make visible the magical, the mythological, and the cognitive spaces of early 20th century Braj arose from a theological imperative that argued for an indifferentiability between the manifest and the unmanifest, between Braj in colonial India and Braj as the eternal abode of Krishna. This interdependent duality in imagining the landscape of the region thus necessitated an artistic strategy that could bring, bring together the celestial and the terrestrial, the otherworldly and the worldly, to present Braj as both a real space in North India and the unmanifest world where Krishna sports eternally. The print by the Bombay-based Bolton Fine Arts Little Work, one of the key presses used by entrepreneurs in the 1930s, thus depicts Krishna performing divine deeds, Radha, Krishna's consort, worshipping her lord, and wild animals beloved to Krishna inhabiting the same space as that of a topi-wearing European tourist taking a pleasure ride in the Yamuna River near the Vishrant Ghat in Mathura. It is no coincidence that the Sahib is depicted near the famed Vishrant Ghat. By the early 20th century, this Ghat in Mathura had become a key destination for European tourists. Repeatedly reproduced in travel posters, stereo views and postcards, the image of, this, of the Vishrant Ghat had become synonymous with the picturesque aesthetic that European tourists sought in a pilgrimage town like Mathura. The 1924 edition of John Murray's Legendary, a handbook for travelers in India, Burma, and Ceylon, thus informs us, the Arti ceremony, or worship of the sacred river, takes place at about dusk at the Vishran Ghat, where cows, monkeys, and turtles are fed. The most convenient way of seeing the ceremony is to take a boat. It is in this momentary coalescence of time and space, the uneasy cohabitation of a European tourist at the Bishran Ghat and Krishna at the Kaliya Ghat, that the representational dilemma that arose with the coming of colonial modernity was negotiated. The enchantment of modern space could take place only when modern techniques could be reconfigured to serve a different politics. Thus, along with the European tourists, modern roadways and bridges were depicted in the lithographs produced for pilgrims, situating Braj in the here and now of colonial time space. It is in this citation, in the heteroglossic speech act of remaking colonial state space, that these particular lithographs departed from pre-colonial painted images of the region. Given that pre-1850s representations of the landscape of Braj did not depict the network of Mughal roadways that connected the pilgrimage towns in the region, it would be safe to assume that the artist responsible for this 20th century lithograph drew his or her visuality from painted images of pilgrimage towns such as Satrunjaya or Natadwara. Thus, rather than representations of Braj itself, pre-colonial pilgrimage, pilgrimage maps from Western India depicting detailed roadways provided a template to imagine 20th century Braj. However, even as these lithographs drew their form from older visual regimes, space was imbued with newer meanings and connotations. Through the process of making visible the new, the roadways that were being built in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as central to an experience of sacred landscape, a new space was invented, one that transcended the abstract space of the empire the space of the empire, the space of order, reason, logic, was thus remade into the space of lived experiences, 
space invested with, with symbolism, with magic, the space of indigenous desires. The simultaneous act of building roadways and mapping these new road networks of Vaishnava space making onto liturgical lithographs thus allowed for a tactical reappropriation of the disciplinary apparatuses of, apparatuses of modern governance. This discursive resistance articulated from within the grid of dominant power, from within state space, thus allowed for a disrupting of the ide ideological fixedness of state space. I propose that this imagining allowed for a rethinking of new religiosities in the 19th and 20th centuries, religiosities that were not anti-modern, but redefined the techno-rational determinism of colonial modernity. In subverting and remaking the techno-rationalism of modernity, a new localized cartography of piety was created. One that moved beyond the dominant cartographies of the British Empire, even as it operated from within it. But to go back to Sumati Ramaswamy's uh, argument about barefoot cartography, how did these localized imaginings of space resist nationalist imperatives? In the early 20th century, the very moment when images such as this were being published, a new iconography of Krishna worship, worship em emerged in urban centers such as Calcutta and Bombay. Scholars have shown the processes through which the resurrection of a warrior Krishna, a Krishna far removed from the groves of Braj, nourished much of late 19th and early 20th century Hindu nationalist politics. One has only to remember Vivekananda, the famous Hindu reformer from Calcutta, who had asserted as early as 1898. At the present time, the worship of the divine play of Sri Krishna with Radha is not good. Playing on the flute will not regenerate the country. <laughs> the history of this making of a proper religion called Hinduism is by now well known. The 1930s also saw the popularization of a new iconography of Krishna where he was no longer depicted in the groves of Braj. Devotional lithographs, such as the one on the screen, released by printing presses from Calcutta, Kanpur, and Rawalpindi, depicted Krishna wielding a disgust-shaped weapon, the Sudarshan Chakra, to defeat evil. This lithograph, published by a Calcutta-based religious organization known for its anti-Muslim rhetoric, exemplifies this new politics. Krishna stands on a modern globe, depicting India while holding a conch and the disgust-shaped weapon, the Sudarshan Chakra, the traditional attribute of a monarchical divinity, divine Vishnu. And Krishna is an avatar incarnation of Vishnu. Labeled in Bengali as Partho Sharoti, Krishna as the charioteer of Arjuna, the righteous hero king of the Mahabharata, the lithograph quotes a passage from the Bhagavad Gita. To reestablish the principles of dharma, that is righteousness or religion, I appear age after age. Further, drawing a direct correlation between the age of the Mahabharata and colonized India, the text below the image pleads, overwhelmed India is looking towards you. Come, Sudarshan bearing Krishna. In comparing the era of, of the Mahabharata to colonial rule, the lithograph thus implores Krishna to come back to in the age of adharma, in the age of irre religiosity, in the age of injustice as the Sudarshan bearing Supreme Godhead. Simultaneously, all traces of the Krishna of Vrindavan with his flute are systematically removed from the t both the text and the image. The making of this iconography of violence, an iconography of a wrathful God, went hand in hand in the 1930s with Hindu-Muslim riots in most major North Indian cities. While we are today all too familiar with many Krishnas, the belligerent Krishna of Hindu nationalism, or even the Krishna of Gandhian nationalism. I propose we delineate yet another history, the history of the Krishna of Vrindavan as embedded in a localized world of politics and piety. And it is in this contradiction, in the slippage of meaning, that the fragmentary tactics of resistance in smaller towns in colonial India becomes discernible. Today we have become accustomed to thinking of the nationalist project as one that was entwined with Western modernity. Localized practices and grudge, often at odds with nationalist or even Hindutva politics, that then makes legible, then makes legible diverse desires that allow us to think of the 19th century 
beyond the epistemological duality of Western modernity and nationalist tradition. I propose we think the local as an analytical category that arose in conjunction with, yet equally importantly, in differentiation from this dominant conceptual norm. However, in marking this differentiation, I am neither proposing the local as a stable category of analysis, nor proposing an ahistorical coherence to this category. Let me thus end my talk by drawing your attention to the lithograph that we began with, the circa 1950 lithograph of Braj still in worship in the Ramachandra temple in Jaipur. If we look at the 1950s print closely once again, we see that by the 1950s, the topi wearing sahib at the Bishrant Ghat at Mathura, the ghat that was depicted in, by brothers in his railway poster, is replaced by an Indian family. Mm -hmm. And you can see that. Mm -hmm. The Congress government under Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister, had created a tourism promotion committee in 1957. In the very next year, a department of tourism was created. David Soffer, in his 90, 1966 study on popular Hindu pilgrimage circuits, notes how Braj was incorporated within a post-independence imaginary of an all-India tour. These organized tours, Soffer writes, took the traveler to pilgrimage sites such as <coughs> Braj, but the tourist also got to see New Delhi and Bombay. Some tours even featured trips to post-independence hydroelectric project sites such as the Bhakranangal Dam in Punjab. As Sofa notes, have darshan or behold the new India was the appeal made by one 1960s handbill. This map, reproduced from Sofa's 1968 essay in the journal Geographical Review, marks the route of the post-independence All India Tour. And you can see how you really create a circumambulation where Braj is involved, included in that larger tour, All India Tour. Perhaps the father of the current priest of the Ramachandra temple had bought the print on one such tour that took him not only to Braj, but also to see the fabled sites of Bombay and Delhi. From its 1960s incarnation into an Indian tourist landscape to its post-1990s or post-liberalism avatar as a pilgrimage site where one could also buy cottages in easy installments and play golf if desired, the story of this pilgrimage site thus resists closure, demanding dexterous epistemological shifts that can, that can adequately account for its multivalent incarnation, multiple parables of locality. How then do we hold together within one narrative the love for land, the Govardhan Hill imagined as the body of Krishna, an embodied space that could bleed if wounded, and a billboard announcing Sri Radha Golf at the same <laughs> site. And perhaps that's a question for another day. Thank you. Well, wow, it's really, thank, thank you so much for all that kind of uh, beautiful uh, discussion of all these interesting things. You know, one thing that strikes me though is, is the, you know, in the representation of, of particularly of uh, Vrajvan Dawan, at least up until the the late nineteenth century, is this this kind of nostalgic resistance, not just to modernity but to the urban in particular. That you know, you're looking at the you know Natwara, you're looking at Banaras, and so on. But now there's something special about uh, Rindavan is that it's a van, mm. right? This is the childhood anti-urban landscape. Krishna leaves the city of Mathura. So in a sense, they don't want to trammel it with, with urban amenities like roads. So the, the main road representation remains circumambulatory around that sacred space. So I think somehow gradually, I think you're right, that these things begin to creep into it, you know, when the roads get to actually invade the space. But there is this, as I think you point out very well, this resistance to literally trampling the body of the god. I mean, you don't want to climb Govardhan because you would be putting your feet on the god. Uh, but that motif of the bleeding of the wounded man, of course, is much more widely spread in uh, Indian religious lore. You have many, many of these stories, the origins of temples, where you know a farmer is digging 
a well blood spurts mm -hmm. from the ground and uh, they look like it's right, there's a lingam mm -hmm. there. Blood, or, milk. Yeah, or the cows mm -hmm. go and let down milk on a site, with a lingam, and then the guy has a dream and then the god appears and you build the temple at that site. So the idea of the, 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 the land being kind of the living body of the god is, is this very kind of nostalgic, uh, almost resistance to the, the, the invasion of that space by modernity. So uh, it is a rather interesting thing to, to, to think about, you know? And I think also, it, especially with grudge, what happens is that the cult, the figure of Chaitanya, dominates the discourse. And Chaitanya, the 16th century reformer, who goes to the site and discovers, has his epiphanies. Mm. And especially within Gaudiya Vaishnavism, there is this strong culture of texts. So the Chaitanya Charitamrita is recited over and again. And it's said that Chaitanya himself did not climb the, rock, the hill. When he went there, he could not climb the hill. So when in today, if I go to the site and if I try to climb the hill, they will remind me that Chaitanya didn't do it. So there is this <laughs> strong idea of how did Chaitanya experience the space. And we are on the footsteps of Chaitanya. So that, that culture of, of how that of these vanayatras and all these texts that describe how do you do this route? How do you go through the groves? How do you, how do you sensorially experience land? Is this kind of this recuperation of the pastoral that I think is involved here? You know, and it's a one. It's a forest. It's a one, and you don't want to invade it with trails, I suppose. But although Mughal roadways were always there, were there, there, were there, but you kind of write, write them out of the picture because it's this nostalgie de la boue, so to speak. You know, they're going back to this kind of imagined, textualized one of the Bhagavatam and so on. And I think it goes yeah. further. It's the one of Goloka. Yeah. It's the celestial world and the terrestrial world. They recite. When yeah. you're in Vrindavan, yeah. you're not just in this world. You're in the other world, too. Uh, so it, the celestial and the terrestrial are actually meeting in Vrindavan. It's also interesting to see how uh, Krishna slash Gandhiji needs the help to hold up the mountain with all these guys <laughs> holding these sticks. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they quite, quite handle it, you know, with the one finger method. <laughs> The, uh, I will dream. You mentioned dreams the night of, of the Raslila on the 17th hole of, of mm -hmm. the uh, Sri Golf Course. What's a kind of deal? As an ethical provocation, but it's it's it's. Uh, so I don't know enough to. I, I thought that I want to link the initial move, which is very elegant, to look at uh, Dan and the building of roadways um, as a central form of, of ethical patronage. And it's it's. So the first question again, out of out of sheer ignorance, is is what history of the, is is extant at all on road building as an F, as a moral practice uh, preceding? So to think about the conditions of this, the because without it, in, in the in part I was thinking about three things that might or might not haunt nineteenth century patronage, which would be uh, you know that is I don't know, don't know here, but I mean how do emerging um, anxiety is broadly distributed around crowds, around cleanliness, and around commerce, organized patronage in the temple town and the building of roads as a meritorious act, but nonetheless, and, and how much is this also part of a, a much longer durée kind of practice which takes on a new kind of form? And so is the building of roads focused, for example, around emerging discourses on festivals and crowds, around the demands of commerce, uh, or demand a uh, sort of escalating languages of garbage and it's it's and then finally if it's local to what extent in this assembling local as you point out the do interregional you mentioned Chaitanya and Gaudiya Vaishnavism but to what extent does Bengal play a role in this patronage and so what kind of local is it? Mm. So um, so to start with questions the first question about roadways and and uh, I mean, we can go back to Ashoka. And Ashoka would build roadways and plant trees around by the roadways. And I'm not suggesting that there is somehow a continuity of, of the idea of building, building roadways as, as a meritorious act. But in the 19th century, for instance, it does become a space of contenting, contending identities. And, and I would say it's not just not Braj. For instance, the road that Cal connects Calcutta to Jagannath Puri, again, the colonial archive tells us that it's built by the British. But recently, a scholar has looked at it. And, and if you look at uh, other sources, it was actually 
paid for by a Gaudiya devotee from Calcutta. Now, what was happening is the colonial government could not have uh, produce enough money to build the roadway, so they look for private contribution. This guy says that I will sponsor the roadway, but I have these clauses. The clauses include his family has complete access to the temple. Now, just before that, there was a rebellion in, in, in Jagatpuri, and the royal family had been given access, so he tries to out of uh, the, the sort of the status quo, he, he transforms it by claiming access to the temple. He wants his name to be at every Sarai on the roadway. Now we think about colonial, uh, the colonial project of mapping, uh, of mapping or road building as a project of economics, but also a project of benevolence. But this, this Gaudiya devotee from Bengal says that I want to inscribe my name on the roadway. So I want to inscribe myself on the colonial topos. And that inscription on the colonial topos is what I'm trying to suggest is a way of taking it out of this state space, uh, imperialist way of thinking about spatial politics. So in that sense, we can think about it. And I'm sure I'm just using one example. One could perhaps think of many other examples of where, where, you, where you fund the colonial project to, but there is a negotiation there. You need to inscribe your own name in it to take, take away from the colonial project and make it into a project of done. The, and, and for instance, with this particular figure, in Calcutta, he becomes a great Gaudiya devotee precisely because he made access to Puri possible. So in Bengali literature in, in Calcutta, he is the great devotee of, of Puri precisely because he's doing that. So he's playing at various registers. He's playing with the local indigenous community, the community of the Gaudiyas in Bengal, by becoming a good, a good devotee. He's also inserting himself into the colonial topos by, in, by literally inscribing his name on the road. Yeah, just also to make a comment uh, on of this, this topic, you said that the first important road built, uh, what did you say, in Matra was from Gwalior. By Gwalior. And I think that that's interesting because a lot of patronage of religious sites comes from the new merchant money classes, mm -hmm. but also from the princes. And in the case of Gwalior, um, pilgrimage to Mantra, to the, to the Christian sites was enormously important. Um, the, the, the British, more dramatically after 1837, but always were trying to contain the princes within their borders. And the one, they had two legitimate reasons for traveling. Uh, one, and one would be after the mutiny to the Durbars, and the, but the other was they were always applying for permission to go to pilgrimage sites. It was their one way of kind of acquiring some honor, legitimacy, status uh, for their religious patronage outside. Um, the Muslim, uh, uh, his neighbor, Gopal, the Begums would travel to Ajmer, but they also would patronize and travel to Mecca, making, in the case of the second Begum, the only Muslim, the first Muslim sovereign of any kind ever. So that's, I, can I say one other thing? Absolutely, please go ahead. Okay, yes. which I can. The, this, this great questionnaire, which we're all instructed to fill out. And please. Let me see, I'll put my glasses off. Did you learn anything at the event that you didn't know before? <laughs> and I just wanted to say, you all did. <laughs> <laughs> but I especially. I think, for example, unlike the people in the first row, did not know what the word subversion meant until you told me. Oh. However, I knew the name because the Sarchons Sarsan, what's he called, Bob, of the RSS. Chala, Sarsan Chala. Was named. Sarsan Chala. Mm -hmm. And I actually have sat in his presence in talking about a great nationalist Muslim, as they always call it. Um, and he strode to the podium and denounced him and all he stood for. However, um, <laughs> what he stood for was, uh, what, did, what was it? I'll never, I have to go find the title of your paper. Um, devotion to the map of India, physical devotion to the map of India. Why did the ulama oppose the creation of Pakistan? I, you know, the, 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 lots of people would say it was because they were moderates. No, wrong. Because all of the sacred sites were in India. And the true reason that art historians can talk about that is because there are probably aren't representations of it except words. Um, 
but in the, in the memorable words of this particular figure I was talking about, these sites emit sacred power. This is a very 1930s image, like radio towers emitting sound waves. <laughs> So though it's not exactly blood, I always like to throw something Islamic into sure. the conversation because you know we always think only Hindus think this way. I'm sorry, no light. <laughs> Please, <laughs> but I think it's and what is interesting about Braj and that, uh, I mean with Ajmer, of course, there's a long history that about got various sorts of patronage. But in Braj, it's not just Gwalior, even Jaipur sponsors the roadways. Right. And remember that Jaipur has a long connection to Braj, which goes back to the 16th century where they patronized temples. Oh. So in the 19th century, Madho Singh is actually sponsoring the rail roadways that connect Jaipur to the main system that connects to Mathura. So he's sponsoring the Nagda Mathura line. Now, that itself is another way where we can think of Braj or any of these pilgrimage sites as, as sort of a, a playing field for various communities or various kings or various uh, princely states to to show their preeminence. Thank you. Um, uh, I would argue that this is something that's still going on within Braj. I mean, with all the Lala's building their roads and, you know, Ramana, oh, you need to go to the uh, behind these and all of that sort of thing. And, um, I would also say that a lot of uh, a lot of I guess the, the branch topography that, that has been created is is also largely I would argue sort of in the early 1960s like the the ISKCON like the Bhakti Vedanta sort of industry that has been created within the larger area like you have the main road is the Bhakti Vedanta mark going right through Chattikara to Vrindavan and then even uh, I, I I was I had a question for you about Vishanka is it Vishanka or is it Vishan or is this like a I'm just going to worry, because I, I know it is. Vishran, Vishran, Vishran. Okay, because we, we know it as Vishran Khan. But also, in terms of the Gwalior Vrindavan uh, uh, connection, I was wondering if you knew anything about the, the Polaris area around Gwalior, which does a complete uh, replication of all of the sites of Vrindavan within Gwalior, so that the Pekinians could just go straight to Polaris instead of going all the way to. Right, I, and that I think goes, I mean, that happens for a long time. I mean, yeah. the Kachwahas would create, the, the Jaipur dynasty would create a Kanak Vrindavan, a golden Vrindavan in Jaipur. In Bengal, you have the Gupta Vrindavan, a hidden Vrindavan. In West Virginia, you have a new Vrindavan. So, so and I think it's, it's very interesting, it's why is Vrindavan so easily taken away from Vrindavan? Be precisely because it's a, it's a site that's been invented in the 16th century, and everyone knows that. So it's, it's really... There is a very interesting play between the celestial and the terrestrial where let's say a Gaudiya devotee from Bengal would say there is no difference between Gupta Vrindavan in Navadip and, uh, and Vrindavan in North India. They're the same thing. It's all a milila. And whenever you ask a question, it's all a milila. It's all a play. It's all a play of the divine. in a way more straightforward. Right? I, I think that what you're suggesting here is not that, it's something else. It's a 
if we find a resistance to a certain idea of space, a certain idea of life. Do you want to just elaborate on that? No, I think. Uh, I, I, I'm not suggesting that this whole project is, is in a certain way anti-modern because what, what, I, what I would like to bring up that it, they are working with modernity, they are building roadways, they are building bridges, they, so there is, they're using photography, so all the, what, what we call the technique of modernity is being used. But what I'm saying is that the technique of modernity is used to serve a different politics which is not necessarily the politics of colonial modernity. When we think about the cartographic imperatives, when we think about road making, when we think about photography, in my larger project I also talk about photography, we think of these as paradigmatic examples of how the empire knew, saw and knew the colony or controlled space or controlled the colony. But what do you do when the indigenous speak the same language? Is it merely a derivative discourse or is there something else going on here? And that is what I'm trying to suggest, that although the language that they speak is the language of the modern, it serves a different politics. I am not suggesting that this is anti-modern. It, it is not looking back to the past and saying that 19th century is is um, evil or is the age of modernity. And I can, a very interesting example is a temple in, in Vrindavan, Radharaman temple, it's one of the most important temples there. And I, have a 19, I saw a 1906 photograph where Krishna is being worshipped and they, they make these flower decorations around the icon. It's of a battleship, mm. of a British battleship. So this is not an anti-modern stance, but precisely to re-engage with modernity in a different language. What does it mean to sit, to make uh, Radharaman sit on a British battleship? I mean, that is not anti-modern. That is a resistance at a different level. So that's what I'm trying to hint at, that perhaps there's a different way of thinking these moments, and we all see these like Krishna is seeing a gram, playing a gramophone, riding a ray, train, and all these images that we see as, and we just pass it off as hybrid moments. But there is possibly something that happens when the engagement with techne, and especially in the word techne, the way techne is being used and reappropriated. Sekhavati, you have all these images of railways with Krishna riding a railway. Is that just a moment of curiosity? I don't think so. It's much more than that. I raise a question about the question of the battleship. I think you said 1906, and is that a British battleship or maybe a Japanese battleship? The Russo-Japanese War and anti-colonial motifs could be in there. I mean, you might want to think of that possibility. Oh, that's a, oh, maybe, yeah, that maybe. Yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah. readings can take various directions. Right, absolutely. No, you're right. Yeah, it could be a. It is a battleship. That. Yeah. No, that it could, I mean, but I'm just simply saying. It could be a Russian. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Could, uh, read it this way. Yeah. yeah. I'm just struck by the undulating road. I mean, it's it's a technique, but it's I mean, it goes back to Bob's pastoral, but it it, it, it or does it? it? It's so I presume it's a because it's a very specific body that's being created. This is not the parikram of Panchkosi road depictions that are all being produced around the same time, but when it's very much in a round, mm -hmm. and in fact, it's by and large a curve. It does develop in the very specific emblematic forms of the highway, but it works. It looks very different. Nor is it that sort of earlier moment in the uh, of the very straight road in, in, uh, the, in the contrastive, uh, not the most them, but, but it, it's so, I'm just really struck by that undulating, and I presume it it's in part does engage with the problem of Krishna's embodiment, that, right. that, the, that this is in fact in some serious sense engaging with all call for the moment, but very cautiously in interiority, or some kind of, uh, it's a working through, and so it, this, it seems striking in this image. I was just following up on that. It's also interesting that the two, you know the image that's being worshipped, um, that roadway is much more undulating mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. the other oleograph from the same kind of period, which seems broader and quite different. It's sort of cut out there, but it's mm -hmm. it's a different roadway that's actually being traced too, right? Or it's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, this is a total aside, but shoots and ladders. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, I'm trying to think with the various forms that are going to be in the marketplace with certain forms of moral demand. The and that's an old and complicated image, shoots and ladders. But the, but again, it's working across the space in marking a certain kind of terrain. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just trying to think with all the all the possible. And what's yeah. inside that road? Yeah. Yeah. But as, as in the lo as in the lotus mm. form. Mm. You have to touch the the, the uh, twelve 
vans. Right. So maybe this is some attempt Tempting. to kind of zigzag around, right. you know, because it's the, yeah. you know, like Haberman has written, of course, about this, mm. you know, it's, it's actually a, a, a uh, you know, the, the Baravan Yatra, that you have to make a certain pilgrimage of the 12 particular subvanas or upavanas, as one of your uh, maps says. So that may be responsive to a certain kind of perceived sense of where you go, uh, which can also be represented circularly with the eight outer vans of right. the lotus and the four inner vans uh, of the lotus. Uh, so there is a certain sense of locationality to it, you know. But I also think there is a certain fidelity. For mm. instance, if you are, this is Mathura, and mm. that's Gokul there. Mm. If you go to Gokul today from Mathura, you actually have to cross the river and go yeah. like this. See. So and what is interesting is that this part of the roadway was sponsored by the Pushtimarga priests or the right. followers of Vallavacharya mm. in Gokul. Mm. So this part was actually sponsored by a community that we had. So there is that possibility of reading it in multiple registers. Huh, huh. The other the two things. One, of course, is that, that replication of a sacred spot here, there, and everywhere. Of course, it's not unique to, uh, no, to no. Vrindavan because it's also done with Ayodhya. Yeah. Right? You know, if you look at the, the pilgrimage uh, of the uh, big Ram Leela, right. Ram Nagar, yeah. they simply recreate the landscape and everybody goes. You know, this is Sakit, and this is the, this is Lanka, and this is you know, like very large. The other thing that's kind of interesting is the way that the the nationalist move is is to flee the, that Krishna, you know, that central Krishna, and place the new Krishna on the globe itself with India at the top, no no Vrindavan, right. and and uh, you know, at the same time that. Uh, uh, Swami Vivekananda is kind of abreacting what probably was his traumatic history with Ramakrishna uh, and his Krishna Fishna right, right. <laughs> rejecting, creating this masculine martial uh, Krishna. You get the same thing you know, in the West with Tilak, who's reinterpreting that very same recuperation of the Gita Krishna, who's the, the tough guy Krishna, the strategist, the diplomatist, and when necessary, whip out the, uh, the Sudarshan and offer their heads. Right. Mm. Yeah. That's kind of a, the two Krishnas become very... And then very we have Gandhi's Krishna also. Huh? And then Gandhi's Krishna. Gandhi's Krishna, yeah. But it's a very I'm complex so Krishna, which I didn't know <laughs> those posts. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe a final... Yeah. In that case... Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. See you Thursday. Um,